Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to our first of two seminars today. So our first speaker today is Benoit Lavreau from the Institute de Research in Astrophysics and Planetology. Benoit received his PhD in space physics in 2004, investigating the Earth's cusps using the ESA cluster mission. And that will be the topic which he will be discussing today, the Earth's magnetospheric cusps. Following his PhD, he became a postdoc and staff member at Los Alamos National Laboratory and is currently working as a research at the Institute de Research in Astrophysics and Planetology. In July, in July, Benoit will be starting a new position as the research director at the Laboratoire d'Astrophysique de Bordeaux in Bordeaux. Benoit's research focuses on solar, planetary, and magnetospheric plasma and dynamics with a focus on magnetic reconnection, data analysis, and particle instruments. He, worked on, he has worked on the cluster, stereo, MMS, and solar orbiter missions, and we are delighted to have him here with us this morning to discuss the Earth's magnetospheric cusps. With that, the floor is yours, Benoit. Okay, thank you, Kai. Thank you for this uh, nice introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so I guess you should uh, stop sharing so that I can share my screen, Kai. Can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Okay, I hope it's not, uh, I hope there's no jet lag, let's say. Um, oh, sorry. So indeed, uh, I've been working on the Earth's magnetospheric cusps uh, during my PhD quite a few years ago now. Um, I haven't been working on it lately, but I've been trying to certainly update uh, the current knowledge on, on the Earth's cusp. Uh, but when it comes in particular to the uh, high altitude cusp, uh, it turns out that only the cluster mission recently has really uh, moved into the high altitude cusp. Uh, the latest uh, missions or even missions to come are actually mostly focusing on the, the low altitude cusp. Anyway, so the outline of my talk will be the following. I will give uh, quite some introduction about what the magnetosphere dynamics is about in, in a rough fashion and describing in particular the cusps within the magnetosphere and the fact that they have a very pivotal role in, uh, in plasma circulation in particular uh, in the whole magnetosphere. Then I will go a bit into uh, the details of the cusp themselves, looking first at the mid to low altitude cusp uh, observations in particular, um, because there are really differences in the way you, you actually look at spacecraft data from mid to low altitudes or at high altitudes. And so I will decompose spatially like this. So concerning mid to low altitude cusp, I will talk about uh, reconnection and convection as a function of the in, uh, in planetary uh, magnetic field in particular. And we talk about things such as the spatial and temporal features that uh, we can see in the cusp. Then I will talk uh, for quite a bit about the polar cusp from high altitude, which is really uh, what I've been working on mostly and, and during my PhD and postdocs in particular. I will uh, show a number of things about the large scale view and small scale view of the cusp. And I will explain also all the global modeling efforts uh, that have been done in terms of uh, of modeling the, the cusp at high altitudes. And I will discuss some waves heating aspects which are still uh, uncertain and, and I will conclude and give uh, some future prospects in terms of uh, cusp physics. So in terms of the introduction, I will uh, describe a bit of the metasphere, the notion of open versus closed metasphere. So there's a bit of a historical perspective here I will go into and then I will show what is the, the latest paradigm, let's say, which is that ma magnetic reconnection really is the main driver of, uh, of the dynamics of the magnetosphere through what is uh, known as the Dungy cycle. And I will show how all this is regulated by the IMF, the Interplanetary Magnetic Field, and how uh, this, uh, this Dungy cycle actually changes depending on, on the, the polarity of the IMF in particular. 
So we just made a sphere, I guess, uh, through all the seminars before, before this one, you, you, you all know what the major sphere is like, just to do a, sorry, just one minute there. So I guess you can see my, uh, my pointer. So as you know, the solar wind is coming from the left. It creates a foreshock, which is this region here. Then you have the shock, which is the first main boundary, which uh, tells the solar wind that there is an obstacle, which is the Earth's madeosphere. The Earth's madeosphere is this, uh, this bubble here, uh, which contains uh, the Earth's magnetic field. And it, has, it is made of a number of regions. It has, for example, the, the plasma sheet, which is in the tail of the metasphere. It has the radiation belts and the ring current in the inside of the metasphere. And then you get the magnetopause, which is the main boundary between the solar wind plasma and the uh, metaspheric plasma. So the magnetopause is really the outer boundary. The metopause is really the, the current sheet that separates uh, solar wind plasma pristine solar wind plasma from, uh, from the metaspheric, uh, uh, from the metaspheric magnetic field and uh, the region influenced by uh, the metaspheric dynamics. So anyway, the cusps are really those regions here. So these are two regions, two singularities within the Earth's magnetic field topology. So essentially, you can imagine that you've got the day side closed field lines on one side, then you've got the tail field lines on the other side, and there is this topological uh, singularity, which are the cusp and which in principle should allow somehow to have plasma going uh, inside them. So in terms of a historical perspective, so the first discovery of a cusp was actually made in the early, early 70s by uh, uh, actual observations from low altitude satellites uh, by Aquila and Winningham and at the same time also by Frank. And so these people actually saw through spacecraft which passed at low altitudes, but high latitudes uh, on the day side of the Earth, but actually there was solo wind plasma that was able to penetrate deep into the magnetosphere along the field lines into these, uh, into these polar regions. So the, the cusp were really defined, first of all, as the observation of solo wind plasma being able to enter the magnetosphere and precipitate to low altitudes uh, down the cusp road. The, uh, this initial view uh, of the cusp, which was uh, uh, discussed in particular by, by Gerard Arundel uh, in this uh, well-known paper of 78, uh, is actually a, a view in which the metosphere is really confined by the solar wind pressure, creating the metopause and where essentially uh, there is no plasma entry into the metosphere through the metopause, which is supposed to be, a, uh, to be closed. Now, what Herendel suggested is that actually you have to have to let plasma in, and the way you can do that would be potentially through uh, uh, diffusive processes at the boundaries, at the metopause in particular, where you would create uh, local plasma entry through diffusion into what, they called already boundary layers at the time, and then the plasma could actually uh, uh, then go down the cusp throat and, uh, and be observed at low altitude. So the, the solar wind is actually, uh, is actually uh, also exerting a pressure on the whole metasphere. And so one thing that very early came on uh, is, that, uh, is that there could be an indentation at the cusps. And this indentation here is seen uh, as this indentation between the entry layer, which is on the day side, and then there is a plasma mantle on the night side. And then you can imagine that the, if, if you have such an indentation like this, then you could create some sort of shocked plasma in the outer cusp region and potentially form an actual shock uh, between the magneto sheath and, and uh, an indentation in the cusp. So these were really the early views before there were true observations of the cusp at high altitudes. So this was really what we can call some uh, pre-cluster conjecture uh, in the sense that cluster was really uh, made with a polar orbit going into high altitude exactly to, uh, to help us understand what is, uh, what is the physics of the cusp and what is the real structure of the cusp at high altitudes in particular. 
So then after this, uh, this historical view of, of a more, let's say, closed mitosphere uh, and potentially with uh, diffusive processes allowing the formation of boundary layers, uh, the uh, open mitosphere became actually the, the new paradigm. And the open mitosphere is based on the fact that this time, instead of having a, a potentially diffusive process, uh, what happens is that tree connection becomes the main driver of uh, the mitospheric dynamics. So you already had a number of talks which uh, discussed uh, the process of mitic reconnection. So mitic reconnection, when you have an IMF which is directed southward, as I am showing here, with this particular fill line, which is directed south, it's actually oppositely directed uh, to the metospheric matic field on the day side here, which is northward. And then you can have reconnection uh, at the subsolar point here, and then you create newly open field lines, which are the red matic field lines here, and which allow plasma to really flow through the metopause and go along the field lines down the cusp road. And then actually you do expect on the red lines which are here to have solo wind plasma. I will uh, ask you to wait for just one minute. I need to, uh, to go see something. I'll be back in just, just 10 seconds. Sorry about that. There was uh, my kids uh, shouting uh, uh, on the next one. Anyway, so, um, so then uh, the solar wind plasma can enter very easily through the reconnection process. And, and the main thing that happens in this case is that indeed you create a rotational discontinuity, which is of the type shown here in the upper right uh, uh, figure. This is as opposed to a tangential discontinuity where you cannot have any plasma go through the boundary with a rotational discontinuity, which you, which you create through the reconnection process, you actually can allow plasma to flow through the boundary and, and really then populate the whole metosphere with a solar wind plasma. So the solar wind plasma can really enter the metosphere through a rotational discontinuity, which is forming essentially the whole metopause uh, in this uh, open metosphere uh, model, let's say, of, of the metosphere. So the way the Dungy cycle works is like this. You have a solar wind fill line, for example, which is coming uh, here in yellow from the left. Then you take uh, one uh, plasma parcel with this, uh, with this point here. As it goes through the solar wind, then you can, through the bow shock, sorry, you can see that it bends like this. And then as it comes in, uh, into contact with the metopause, it actually will reconnect with the metospheric fill lines through a, a reconnection site at the subsolar region. And then you have a transfer of solar wind plasma and momentum at the same time, which allows you to drive the convection in the entire metosphere. Because you drive the plasma onto the fill lines, you actually drive the convection uh, like this, and the fill lines are dragged all the way to the night side until it actually reconnects back again in the tail region and then the plasma may convect and the fill lines may convect back towards the day side. Uh, here you have to uh, imagine that you are in three dimension and then back towards the day side. This whole process of reconnecting on the day side, then on the night side and having a circulation of the matic flux and of the solar wind plasma is called the Dungy cycle and, and, and is now really the, the main uh, paradigm about how things work, in particular during southward IMF. As I was explaining, uh, during southward AMF, you have reconnection expected uh, at the day side. So here I'm showing, uh, I'm showing a, a graph, uh, a figure to explain that you have re uh, reconnection on the day side for southward AMF, and then you, you drive convection in the metosphere uh, towards the tail. So for southward AMF, reconnection may occur at low latitudes. In the cusps and the polar cap, convection is tailward. So you can see this red arrow here, the convection is tailward. And the outer cusp boundary, so the, the metopause uh, at the outer cusp boundary, is supposed to be a rotational discontinuity, and you have uh, plasma going through this boundary, 
at all times. As I will explain a bit later also, you do expect the presence of a plasma mantle at high uh, latitudes in the sense that in the lobes, near the lobes, you expect to form a plasma mantle, which is due to the, to the dispersion of uh, the ions from the reconnection on the day side. And what is of importance is that, in fact, this open mitosphere model becomes quite different if you have a different interplanetary magnetic field orientation. In particular, if you have a northward AMF instead of having a southward AMF, this time the magnetic fields on the day side are parallel between the mitosphere and the solar wind. And therefore, the only location where you can have reconnection in an anti parallel fashion is in the lobes of the mitosphere. So this time you can actually have reconnection occurring in the lobes instead of the day side. And because the tension of the magnetic fields at the reconnected field line is actually opposite to the, to the flow in the major sheaf, then you tend to have this time a convection of the plasma and of the field line, which is towards the day side instead of being towards the night side as for southward AMF. So this time reconnection occurs at high latitudes. The cusp and the polar cap convection are sunward instead of being tailward. The outer cusp boundary is still a rotational discontinuity allowing the plasma to flow through it. But this time, because the convection is sunward, you do not uh, create a plasma mantle on the night side. So now we'll go a bit more into the details of the uh, observations of a cusp. And I will start with uh, the mid to low altitude uh, cusp observations. So what do cusp data look like? This is what it looks like. So if you look at the left plots, you can see an energy time spectrogram for the ions. So these are ion data with energy as a function of time. And the color tells you about the flux of the ions. Okay. Then you have the velocity of the plasma, the three uh, components, Vx, Vy, Vz. And then you have the IMF, which is prevailing in the solar wind from the Omni database. So you can see here that the IMF is, is a southward with a BZ, which is negative. So the solar wind uh, magnetic field is really southward. So under such condition, we expect reconnection to occur at low latitudes on the day side. And we expect to have a convection, which is going uh, towards the day. So what happens in the cusp is that because you reconnect on the day side, you do have plasma entering along field lines, as I can show, as I show here for an ion of high energy in red. Okay, an ion of high energy will enter through the field lines because it has been newly opened by reconnection. It will go down, precipitate uh, it towards the ionosphere, but potentially it will actually be mirrored by the magnetic field and then go back uh, into what we call the plasma mantle. Now, if you have ions of different energies, then a lower energy ion, for example, will actually be slower and has the magnetic field lines are actually convecting toward the tail. It will take a longer time to go and mirror at low altitudes. And therefore, you will see a dispersion in the signatures that you see uh, with a spacecraft passing at low altitudes. You will see a dispersion in the energy time or latitude, because time and latitude is equivalent if you have a spacecraft uh, going over time like this uh, with increasing latitude, time becomes this, the same as the latitude. And so you will see high energy particles at lower latitudes and lower energy particles will only come later at higher latitudes. And so you expect to see a dispersion in the energy of the ions, which we actually see exactly on this plot. Here you have the energy spectrograms of the ions as you do a cut at low altitudes. And you can see, uh, first you are on close field line on the day side and you can see the plasma sheet ions. But then you start to see, at this point in time, you start to see the first solar wind ions which are being injected along the newly opened field lines. And then you only see the highest energy ions. And as you go towards higher latitudes, which is the same again as uh, the time. As you go with, uh, with time or latitude, then you see the energy of the ions, which is going down on average slowly. And this uh, corresponds to this uh, 
to this dispersion pattern I was, uh, I was explaining, which is due to the fact that you have a tailward convection in the cusp. So for South LMF, you do expect precipitation at low latitudes. So you have most of the precipitation from which you can see in this velocity uh, enhancement here, which is occurring at low latitudes. And then you have a tailward convection with a dispersion pattern, which is due to these uh, different uh, energy of the ions which are entering the metosphere. So the plasma is able to penetrate deep inside the metosphere, deep inside the cusp, but with a very specific uh, character. This is for southward AMF. If I now look at the same type of crossing, but for northward AMF, this time for northward AMF, what we expect is that reconnection is not occurring at the day side, but instead it's occurring with the lobes. And this time the convection is towards the tail, but it's actually towards the day side. And so you expect to have exactly the opposite dispersion pattern, which is as your spacecraft is crossing from the day side towards the tail, with increasing latitude uh, being the same as time. Uh, this time you actually expect to have the high energy ions being on the tailward side of the, uh, of the crossing and actually the lowest energy ions being on the day side. And so that's what you see here in the energy time spectrogram for the ions. You can see the plasma sheet ions which are on the day side on closed field lines. And then the first ions you see of soloing origin are actually ions of rather lower energy and you see the average energy of the ions uh, increasing towards higher latitudes and then you start losing the lowest energies when you are at the highest latitude. So you really have uh, a completely opposite convection pattern and therefore a completely opposite dispersion of the ion uh, features. Also, because this convection is completely reversed, you do not have this plasma mantle on the tailward side uh, of the cusp. So the convection is different, but the precipitation is still there. It is just at higher uh, latitudes, and the convection is also very different. You don't have a regular dungy cycle with tailward convection. This time you have, uh, you have sunward convection in the cusp. And it's actually a lower convection because the tension of the field lines this time is opposite to the flow in the meta sheet. So now I'm coming to the, to the plot cusps at uh, mid to low altitude, talking about two specific, uh, one specific uh, question, which is the spatial versus temporal features in the cusp and, uh, and how it actually leads to some uh, plasma structuring in the mid to low altitude. Uh, so there's been a number of studies, uh, in particular in the 90s and in the 2000s, it's been a very hot topic. Uh, the fact that sometimes uh, the, the cusp had have very uh, localized and uh, temporal features showing in the data. So here I'm showing again an energy time spectrogram. I'm showing again the velocity of the ions and the IMF during a specific crossing at rather low altitudes again. But this time, instead of seeing uh, a very simple and clean dispersion in the ions as I was showing before, this time we can see several clean boundaries where the plasma somehow uh, changes drastically in character with, uh, with, uh, with sharp boundaries and what we call cusp ion steps. So there are steps in the ion spectrogram which are somewhat due to temporal or spatial variation, we don't really know, and a lot of people have worked on it. But essentially, uh, one of the ideas is that, indeed, you may create those steps uh, if you actually have a time varying reconnection rate at the day side in particular. So if you take a reconnection uh, X line at the day side, and if you assume that the rate of reconnection of your X line may vary with time, then if you have a satellite down the cusp, you can imagine that you will see uh, bunches of ions coming in a temporal fashion at your spacecraft because you actually have your reconnection rate going on and off, or at least higher and lower with some variability. And so if your reconnection is intermittent or even patchy, then you can explain why you have some uh, cusp steps like this. So the intermittence of the reconnection process can certainly lead 
to, uh, to such uh, temporal viability in the cusp uh, features. But there's been some other explanations, which have been in particular studied by uh, Caroline Stratner, uh, that in order to have those steps in the cusp uh, ion data, there's also a spatial uh, explanation that, that, that may come into play. And this comes from the fact that you may have a structured reconnection line uh, at the myelopause with different convection patterns uh, so in, in the cusp. And so, for example, you can imagine now this is actually a, a look at what we call the convection patterns in the poles. So you are looking at the poles from above. The sun is actually to uh, uh, upwards. And then you look at the, 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 the poles from above the earth. And then you look at the direction of convection of flux tubes uh, above the pole, so in terms of a convection pattern. And, and then what, what this is supposed to show is that you may have one X line which creates one channel of convection in the ionosphere and another X line from another location on the metopause which creates an other channel of soloing convection in the ionosphere. So what it means is essentially you have several channels in the ionosphere and in the cusp coming from different X lines on the metopause and which all have different soloing characteristics. And this means that if you go from one flux tube to another, if they come from different X lines, then you can actually see uh, different plasma parcels and different plasma um, different plasma properties from one to the next. And this could very well explain if you have a space tra trajectory which is crossing such different flux tubes, then you can expect to see such uh, steps in your, in your cusp ion spectrograms. So really this is a second type of explanation. Instead of being a temporal viability, it is more of a spatial viability of the reconnection process. So as of now, uh, to me, there is no, uh, there is no uh, clearly uh, uh, defined uh, winner or loser in, uh, in, this, uh, in this battle, I would say. Uh, both are very likely possible, both the intermittent reconnection scenario and the uh, spatial extent or stru spatially structured X lines at the day side. And there's actually uh, uh, two missions, and in particular one, which is the NASA's uh, Tracers mission, which is really, uh, which is going to be launched in 2023 and which is uh, aimed at uh, understanding better this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this story of intermittent versus uh, spatially structured x -line. Okay, so now I'm going into the polar cusp at uh, high altitudes. I will uh, first look into uh, the, the boundaries and explain the, the, the structure in terms of the boundaries of the high altitude cusp, which really uh, uh, cluster the cluster space we have the first to, uh, <coughs> to really be able to, uh, to sample in details. So we'll talk about the location of the boundaries, about their nature, and how they allow plasma entry. So the high altitude cusp this time. So before I was focusing on the low altitude cusp again, but the, but now I will be looking into this uh, really the highest altitude region of, of the cusp, which was uh, the, the subject of my uh, PhD. So here on the, this time, uh, the type of orbit that we are looking into are orbits really going uh, from this point one, which I'm showing here, out into the Maeto sheaf through this, uh, this high altitude region. Here I'm showing again an ion energy time spectrogram. And here I'm showing the magnetic field. This is from an early paper in the cluster uh, era. So what you can see is that uh, as you go from the lobes or plasma mantle into the exterior cusp, you go here with no plasma at all because this is a northward IMF case. So there is no plasma mantle in this case. And then you enter directly into the cusp region and you stay in the cusp for several hours until here uh, 22. So for two hours, you actually stay in the cusp until you actually reach the uh, outer boundary with the Maito sheaf, which is this boundary here. So essentially what you have to, to see is that the first main boundary of the cusp 
of the exterior cusp is this number one, which is the boundary with the lobes. So you have the lobes on the left side with no plasma, and then suddenly you can see soloing plasma showing up. This is this first boundary with the lobes. Then you have a second boundary, which is this boundary marked up here, which is a boundary between the cusp and the day side plasma sheet, because you can see that this region here uh, has a lot of high energy ions. So this boundary called number two is actually a boundary between the exterior cusp and the day side closed field lines, because these high energy ions, which I'm showing here, are actually high energy ions on closed field lines on the day side of a metasphere. So that's the second boundary with the day side. And then your, the third boundary is really this boundary here, where you go from the exterior cusp, which has low magnetic field and hot plasma, into the mito sheath proper. The mito sheath is this uh, area here. And this third boundary is the boundary with the day side mito sheath the outermost boundary, and that's really the metopause. The true metopause is the boundary, which is the rotational discontinuity extending from the day side uh, out into the tail, or the opposite if you have no problem F, but which constitutes the last boundary between the metosphere and the metosheath. So really you have three boundaries, one, two, and three, one with the outer metos with the mato sheath, one with lobes, and one with a day side plasma sheath. If you get interested in all these boundaries in more details, it actually turns out that if you use multi spacecraft techniques, you can actually determine what is the plasma flow through the boundary, and you, through some, uh, some MBA technique and multi spacecraft timing analysis, uh, so here, for example, you have the four curves from the four magnetometers on board cluster. Based on this, you can recalculate a normal boundary velocity and then use the actual plasma measurement to determine the normal plasma flow through the boundary. And we could determine this way that this boundary, the boundary between the cusp and the major sheaf, is really an open boundary, a type of rotational discontinuity which allows the plasma to flow through it permanently and therefore create uh, the cusp and the exterior cusp in particular and permit the plasma to flow into the major sphere. The boundary which is here on the day side, this boundary which I called number two in the previous slide, this boundary here on the day side is actually a tangential discontinuity. There is no plasma which is flowing through it. It just merely uh, separates the day side closed field lines from the open field lines of the cusp. So really the, the open boundary which allows plasma to flow through it is the major pause at high altitudes between the cusp and the major sheath. Now I will show uh, the more large scale view of the cusp uh, through uh, statistical analysis in particular. So some studies we did is actually to try to do some uh, superposed epoch uh, statistical analysis. So here I'm trying to explain the method that we have, uh, that we have used uh, early on already to do some statistics of the cusp properties. So you can imagine that the, the cusp is this region here, but because the uh, conditions in the mate sheaf and the solar wind are varying a lot, if you want to be able to do a, a proper statistical analysis of your data in, in a proper frame, then you need to define a normalized frame for your data. So there are two things which are important uh, to try to find a normalized frame. One is that the latitude of the cusp is actually changing uh, with the IMF and the dynamic pressure of the solar wind. If you have a large, a, a, a low dynamic pressure, uh, excuse, excuse me, if you have a low dynamic pressure, then the major pause uh, and the cusp uh, latitude will actually change. The cusp latitude, for example, will, uh, will, will uh, go to lower latitude if you have a higher dynamic pressure, and it will uh, also go to lower latitude if you have a southward AMF. If you have a northward AMF, it will tend to go to higher latitude. So, 
To give you an example here on the left, if I have no fault AMF then and low dynamic pressure, my cusp latitude may be this red line and my metopause position may be this red line. Okay, and if I have for reference IMF or dynamic pressure, if I take the metopause as being located here at an average position and the cusp latitude being at an average position, then what I do is that I use um, is that I use a, a model of a metosphere, uh, uh, magnetic field in particular from the Tsiganenko 96 model, and then I use a metopause position model from the from Shu et al in uh, 97. And then what I do is I do a renormalization of the position of each of my data points into a normalized frame of reference um, for every single data point in the, in the cluster data set. I try to normalize my position with respect to the cusp, depending on what the IMF uh, direction is and depending on what the dynamic pressure uh, is in the soloing as well. So again, if you have northward IMF and a low dynamic pressure, you will tend to, the method will actually tend to lower the uh, latitude of the cusp. So a data point which is uh, supposedly here will actually be uh, in the superposed epoch. Uh, it will come back into place in the reference, in the normalized reference frame in this location, which, uh, which means that you both uh, normalize with respect to the latitude of a cusp and to the position of a metopause. So when you do this, then you can build a statistical map of uh, the properties of a cusp using uh, many years of cluster data, and this is what we did here. So when you use all the orbits from cluster, so you can imagine that you have many, many orbits going, uh, going through this plot here. All these orbits have been normalized in the way I just explained, which is a, a spatial-temporal superposed epoch analysis. And when you do this, then you can see that if, you, if I plot the density measured by cluster as it goes through the cusp, normalized by the solar wind density at this time, then you can see that you get a map, a statistical map of the density in the cusp, where you can see the cusp indentation very clearly here. Okay, and here you can see these are the day side closed field lines of the plasma sheet with a very low density. And here you have the lobes with a very low density as well. The highest densities are measured in the Mato sheaf, which is expected. But then you can really recover the very clear cusp indentation because plasma is actually throwing, flowing through the outer boundary and really uh, filling the whole cusp with solar wind plasma. So the high altitude cusp, first and foremost, is actually a diamagnetic cavity. The magnetic field is actually lowered and the density is enhanced. So I, I showed here that the density is enhanced. Now on the left here, I'm showing that the magnetic field is actually decreased. What I'm plotting here is the ratio of the magnetic field divided by the expected theoretical magnetic field from the Tsiganenko 96 model. When you have a blue value, it means that the magnetic field measured by cluster is much lower than the one expected from a theoretical model. So it really means that the magnetic field has been lowered and it has been lowered, it is lower, because plasma has entered through the cusp so following Lenz's law and, uh, and by just, uh, and by just uh, pressure balance, uh, you need to have a decreased magnetic field if the plasma has, has come in. So the cusp is really, uh, at high altitude in particular, is really a diamagnetic, a diamagnetic cavity. Okay, uh, so now, uh, Looking into uh, uh, the same thing, statistically on the right, you have this time a map of the parallel velocity of the ions uh, using the same method. This time I'm showing the data only for when the IMF is southward uh, with a clock angle uh, larger than 120 degrees. So this is why you can see that the, the mapping is a bit less good than uh, 
than when you have all data points. If you use only some IMF direction, then the, the mapping is, uh, the statistics is a bit less because these maps were made uh, from, uh, from three years of uh, cluster data. So what you see from this map, again, is the parallel velocity of the ions. And what you can see, the main feature to, to see is really that the parallel velocity is mainly enhanced at uh, the lower latitudes of the cusp here, which correspond exactly to the fact that you have reconnection on the day side and the plasma entering along the magnetic fields into the cusp at the lowest latitudes. If you take uh, a crossing of a spacecraft through this region, this is what you observe here also, where you have the ion energy spectrogram as a function of time. The magnetopause is here, and you can see very large flows in the cusp going mostly tailward <coughs> in this region and being mostly parallel as well. So you have precipitation at low latitudes, you have very large flows in the cusp, and you actually also have a plasma mantle, which is this uh, region here, um, which is this region here. Now, if so what it means is that under, under Southward AMF, you really have this uh, this, uh, this uh, schematic, which is, uh, which is valid, which is you have reconnection on the day side. You create a strong acceleration uh, through the reconnection process so that you drive convection in the cusp and in the whole mitosphere being tailward. So you have large tailward convection in the mitosphere driven by reconnection uh, on the day side. Now, if you have a northward AMF, as I explained already uh, before, this time you do not have a plasma mantle. Instead, what you have is a, is a lobe which is devoid of plasma. And then suddenly, under northward AMF, you can see a region at high latitudes with strong flows towards the Earth, because you can see here the VZ is strongly negative. So this time, if a spacecraft is crossing into the cusp from the lobes out into the mitoshis. This time, the, uh, the statistical maps, which are here again from three years of data, they show that the parallel velocities, which are, it's the same as I showed before, the parallel velocities, this time they are not at the low latitude boundary, but they are at the high latitude boundary, which is here. And this is consistent with the fact that the plasma is coming from a a reconnection region which would be located in the lobes uh, instead of being on the day side as it was for southward AMF. So for northward AMF uh, this time, the, the statistical picture is consistent. You have uh, reconnection in the lobes and then uh, plasma precipitation mostly at, uh, at the high latitudes without the presence of, of a plasma mantle. So this time, you have a next line at high latitude, a low sunward convection because your uh, fill lines uh, tension is actually opposing the flow in the mato sheath. And the whole structure of the cusp again is consistent with a high latitude reconnection. Okay, so now I'm going into uh, the global modeling aspects and talking in particular about numerical simulations of the cusp, which have come in in particular lately, thanks to, uh, to more computing power. And I will talk also about modeling in terms of uh, the famous indentation of a cusp, which uh, a number of people have uh, talked about. So there are three main approaches to, uh, to doing global numerical modeling of the mitosphere in general, and therefore of the cusp also. So very early on already in the 90s, there's been a number of uh, studies uh, which have been focusing on the cusp through global IMGT modeling. There's been some by uh, Jimmy Rader or Bina Palmroth. Uh, but then I've come, oh, apparently I forgot to put the right dates, uh, but I've, gone, uh, I've come a number of global hybrid simulations by uh, Nico Midi and Omar Karim Abadi and other people doing hybrid simulations. And uh, more recently, there's been some uh, global full kinetic simulations uh, by Kai and uh, Ed Miley and uh, and so I would say that when it comes to, to the global structure of, of the cusp and the high altitude cusp in particular, uh, most of these modelings have been, uh, have been uh, consistent and, and showing uh, again that 
the, the custody uh, play a, a pivotal role in, in how the dynamics of the major sphere is driven, and in particular, this aspect of having reconnection even on the day side and very large tailward convection over the cusp, or having reconnection in the lobes, as in this case, and creating a smooth and slow uh, sunward convection. One aspect which has been uh, interesting is actually the fact that a number of people have tried to model the, the magnetopause in general, but also the magnetopause specifically in the cusp region. And as I mentioned uh, uh, earlier on, uh, historically there's been uh, some suggestion that there could be an indentation of the magnetopause at the high altitude in the cusp. A lot of modeling efforts uh, such as these ones, have suggested that there could be one, and they have tried to, uh, to fit uh, magnetopause crossings to an indented magnetopause. So you can see the, the, the analytical model which is, uh, which is behind the modeling and, and, and which is indented at the cusp uh, uh, initially. And then they are trying to fit all the magnetopause crossings uh, from cluster and other missions uh, to, to this analytical model to, to rebuild a, a proper model of the metopause. The issue with this is that, uh, is that the metopause you use at high altitudes have to be uh, the proper metopause. And in particular, what I, as I showed a bit earlier, you have three distinct boundaries uh, with a cusp. You have Boundaries here, which I show, which are boundaries with the lobes and boundaries with a day side metopause, which can very easily be taken uh, as the metopause and used for such large scale modeling purposes. But in reality, the true metopause is really the outer boundary, and there's no obvious reason uh, for this boundary to actually be indented. Certainly, the two inner boundaries with the lobes and with the day side plasma sheet are indented by nature but the outer boundary with the meta sheath, the actual metopause, has no obvious reason to be indented, uh, neither physically, neither in the data, or at least there is no evidence so far, in my view, that this, uh, that this outer boundary, the true metopause, uh, is indented. So is there a cusp indentation? Uh, yes, there is, in the sense that the inner boundaries are by, na by nature indented, but I am uh, by no means sure that the outer boundary, the true metopause, is indented. There is no evidence for this. Then I will go uh, quickly into uh, the waves and heating in the, in the cusp. Um, so the first thing is that very early on, we, uh, Steve Fuselier in particular in 95, 97 has been, uh, has been observing that there is strong heating of the electrons and ions at the metopause. This is here an example of an electron spectrogram as one crossing, crosses through the metopause. So the electrons here on the left are within uh, the cusp or within the boundary layers. And as you go outside into the meto sheath, which is on this side, you can see that the electrons are much less hot. So really you have some heating process which is occurring between the meto sheath here on the right side and the metosphere. The electrons and ions are heated through the metopause. And the origin of this heating is not very well known. Uh, there has been a, a lot of studies showing that the heating occurs, but how does it occur through wave particle interaction, for example, or through other processes is still something that people are working on uh, at this time. But we know at the same time that there is a lot of waves uh, in the polar cusp themselves. So what I'm showing here on the left is a spectrum uh, from early studies of waves in, uh, in the cusp region, in the high altitude cusp in particular. And so Katarina Nikiri in particular uh, showed a number of cases where you have several harmonics uh, in, the, in the spectrum, which are also suggestive of very strong uh, wave particle interaction. And when you have a strong wave particle interaction, obviously, you do expect to have a plasma heating occurring. This was also shown uh, using uh, the wave data on cluster by uh, Benjamin Grison, uh, with similarly some uh, good correlation between 
the wave intensity and the pitch angle of uh, distribution of the of the particles, suggesting again that there are, that there are strong um, uh, wave particle interaction going on in the cluster. So not only uh, we do expect to have strong healing of soloing plasma as it enters through the mitopause, so exactly at the boundary between the mitosheaf and the cusp, but we do also expect strong heating within the cusp itself once the particles have already entered into that region. Um, this one, I guess, I will uh, will skip. Uh, so now I'm going into the conclusions and future prospects. So the conclusions uh, we can say are that the cusp are really diamagnetic cavities. They are forming a, a transition region between the mitosheath and the mitosphere. The key thing is that the boundary, uh, the outer boundary, is open. It is the result of mitic reconnection, and this boundary really is a mitopause. And reconnection at the mitopause is really what allows the plasma precipitation and convection, and therefore all the plasma circulation in the mitosphere. And depending on the IMF orientation, this circulation and the, the, the general uh, path of the plasma within the mitosphere is very different. If you have a South of AMF, you have low latitude reconnection, and then you, you, you create the Dungy cycle. If you have no for AMF, then you have low reconnection, and this time you have rather low convection in the cusp and in the mitosphere. This is because your field line tension is actually opposing the, the mitosheath flow, and this time the, the whole convection in the mitosphere is actually reversed. There is no obvious indentation no very good reasons for having an, uh, an indentation of, uh, of the metopause above the cusps. But in any case, uh, certainly the, the whole cusp is uh, structured at large scale by metic reconnection. So the importance of, uh, of, this, uh, of the cusp and how it, uh, it, uh, it drives the metospheric dynamics uh, has implications also for the formation of the boundary layers and the plasma sheet. It's been shown in particular that for southward AMF, the plasma sheet is rather hot and tenuous, while for northward AMF, it is rather cold and dense. And one of the reasons uh, that can explain all this is indeed that there is a, a pivotal role played by plasma circulation through the cusps in particular. If you have reconnection on the day side, and then you drive all the field lines towards the night side, and then create the circulation back uh, towards the, uh, the near-earth region, then you can expect that you will have rarefaction of the plasma above the cusp and, um, and plasma mantle because of the dispersion process I was mentioning earlier on. And then you have further adiabatic heating as you uh, have the fill lines shrinking into the, the near-earth region. So through, through Fermi and uh, Betatron heating processes, uh, the field lines here uh, provide a hotter plasma into the inner regions. So this whole circulation actually suggests that under southward AMF, you have indeed a hot and tenuous plasma uh, in the plasma sheet. By contrast, if you have northward AMF and you can create uh, newly closed field lines as these uh, red lines here, if you have reconnection in the lobes of the two hemispheres, then you can expect to have reconnection closing new field lines on the day side. And so this time what you do is that you trap solo wind plasma, which is already dense, on field lines which are already short. And therefore you create rather cold and dense plasma on already short field lines on the day side. And these may then drift to the flanks and into the plasma sheet without much further heating and without losing much plasma. And that would be an explanation, a simple one, for creating what we call uh, the cold dense plasma sheet on the night side. And so the cusp, and uh, in particular reconnection in the vicinity of the cusp, is uh, very important in, uh, in this uh, process. Now in terms of future prospects, there are two space missions which will be of uh, great interest for cusp physics. The first one is the NASA's uh, Tracers mission. It will be two spacecraft. Uh, as it is shown here in this figure, 
uh, from low altitude, it will be, I think, at uh, 600 kilometers altitude, two spacecraft uh, very closely separated to try to disentangle these spatial versus temporal features in the cusp that I was uh, explaining a bit earlier on. And this uh, multi-spacecraft uh, mission will be launched in 2023 under the PA ship of Craig uh, Kledzin. There will also be the ESA and uh, China SMILE mission, uh, which uh, will actually study uh, X-rays uh, from coming from charge exchange of uh, multiply uh, charged uh, O plus, for example, uh, from the solar wind. And so what, we, what it will allow is to do imaging in X-rays of the large scale uh, boundaries of the cusp and of the metropole. And so the PI of the, this mission is, uh, is Graziella Pandua de Raymond. And that will be, uh, you, as you can see, the timing of the two missions is very, very nice to actually do combined studies of the CUSP and its dynamics. So there's a number of uh, remaining open questions about the CUSP. The first big one is indeed whether reconnection at the metopause is intrinsically patchy or intermittent. And that's uh, the main goal of the TRACERS mission. Uh, then uh, one. Uh, uh, wonder still about what role waves and turbulence really play in the cusp still, and what are the roles of uh, diffusion, acceleration, uh, and heating by waves and such things. There is still also some uncertainty about the nature of the cusp shift boundary, the, the magnetopause, which has sometimes a weird, uh, some weird properties. Uh, and then uh, under Southwood AMF, uh, we still wonder whether uh, uh, the Dungy cycle is uh, sufficient to really explain the plasma sheet density or whether flux transport is, uh, is potentially needed uh, also during South of MF. And uh, another question still open uh, to some level is whether double high latitude reconnection or the Kelvin Amol's instability on the flanks are really mostly the, uh, the key processes for forming the plasma sheet under North of MF. And uh, with this, uh, I am uh, finished, I think. And I'm uh, thanking a lot of people who have been uh, working on these topics uh, until, uh, until recently. Thank you. Thanks for a great overview, Benoit. Um, we have a couple questions, uh, three right now. Uh, the first one is from Li Jin Chen. Uh, she's curious about northward IMF and high latitude reconnection and whether under these or during northward IMF, is it necessary that you get sunward convection? Uh, that is, does the field line tension necessarily win over the solar wind convection toward the tail uh, during northward IMF? Okay, so it's a, it's a good question, and we've been wondering about that for quite some time. Uh, so essentially, what the observations show is that there is indeed almost always a clear, slow sunward convection in the cusp and in the ionosphere during, uh, during Norfolk AMF. So what it means is that indeed, uh, the reconnection line, which is, which is here above the lobes, tends to be in a, in a regime such that it can be relatively steady. There's been a number of studies by, uh, actually by Steve, uh, Steve Fuselier, myself also, which, which have shown that even though you are at high latitudes, the reconnection side here turns out to be in a subalvenic magneto shift flow. And if you are in a subalvenic magneto shift flow, then your fill line tension is able to go sunward and to drive sunward convection. It turns out that the plasma depletion layer, which is forming just on the outside of the metopause, is contributing to the fact that you keep a subalvenic flow close to the X-line. And so it conspires to allow your X-line to be steady above the lobes. There has been a few uh, studies, a few papers, which suggested the X-line sometimes is not steady and may create FT-type structures, but in general, it's been shown to be rather steady and in, and in subalvenic flow. I hope this answers the question. Thanks. Um, so our second question comes from David Seibeck. 
the magneto sheath flow might become supersonic or super alphanic before reaching cusp latitudes. In this case, the mantle might pose an obstacle requiring a standing shock wave in the magneto sheath. Is there any evidence for such a shock wave standing upstream of the mantle or mantle slash lobes in the cusp? So, so the first part of the question, I guess I answered it in my, uh, in my last uh, answer. Mm -hmm. which is that we have shown statistically, although I didn't show it here, but using this, uh, this uh, statistical technique I, mentioned, I showed a bit before, we, we showed that uh, typically the, the, the plasma uh, at high latitude remains subalvenic much more than expected and because of a plasma depletion layer. So the second, the second part, which is about the shock, my short answer is that indeed, there is no evidence in the data, as far as I know, that you could become supersonic at the cusp latitudes and create a shock. It has not been demonstrated conclusively, as far as I know. Okay, thanks. And so our last question comes from uh, Patricia Rafe. There's evidence of a weak, trapped high-energy electron population in the outer cusp. So Patricia has suggested that it might be on open field lines, but trapped in the diamagnetic cavity between the Earth and a kink at the magnetopause. Do you know if there's any new insight with regard to this process? Uh, I'm afraid no. no. Okay. Excellent. No, I'm, I'm not sure I see exactly the process uh, at hand. Um, but you certainly do expect trapping in the cusp, huh? indeed, because it's a diamagnetic cavity with much lower magnetic field than the surrounding. So you do expect some trapping for for uh, for pitch angles, in particular, close to ninety degrees. Um, so it surely exists, but but it's clearly just a matter of energy and pitch angle. Okay, thanks. Um, so that's everything today. Um, Uh, yeah, sorry, some people are just following up with some comments, but not questions. Um, so that's all that we have, at least for this morning. Um, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, we have another one in about an hour by El Said. Uh, he's going to be talking about the solar wind follow on mission. So hope to see everyone in an hour with our second talk today. Thank you, everyone, and enjoy the little break. Thank you. Bye bye.